I'm Hello, everybody. Welcome to um, our panel on the works of Carol M. Schwiller and Rick Raphael. I'm Matthew Cheney, and I'm moderating the panel. And we're going to do quick introductions first. Uh, then we're going to go into the works of Rick Raphael and follow that up with the works of Carol M. Schwiller. Um, I'll start. I'm Matt Cheney. I uh, am a writer and teacher based in New Hampshire. Uh, and I have a couple of books out, a collection of short stories and an academic book about Virginia Woolf, Samuel Delaney, and J.M. Curtsey, who all belong together. Um, Michael, I see you next. Okay, um, I was an editor in for, for Harcourt and then for the Modern Language Association. At Harcourt, I uh, acquired some uh, science fiction writers and I was writing, at the time I was writing science fiction myself. And I'm not, I don't remember how I got acquainted with Carol, but there was a group of us in, in the city that were, would have like a science fiction lunch and Carol was one of the people. And we kind of spent some time together at these lunches and at some other events. And uh, I'm going to say a few words about her animal stories, about the mount, and about her feminism, which I find very interesting. Great, thank you. Uh, Richard, I see you next. Uh, I'm Richard Butner, I'm based in North Carolina. I uh, write short fiction and also uh, plays and performance pieces. Uh, for a long time, I've been associated with the Sycamore Hill Writers Conference that was started by John Kessel and some other folks in the 1980s. And I've been running that myself since uh, 2006. Um, which is where I first met Carol was at a Sycamore Hill workshop. And, uh, I, and I have a collection coming out next February from Small Beer Press, a collection of stories called The Adventurists. Wonderful. I didn't know that. That's exciting. Uh, Sharianne. Hi, my name is Sharianne Lewitt. I um, wrote something like 17 novels under five different names, most of them hard science fiction, uh, a few YAs, a little bit of fantasy here and there. Um, and when the kind of hard science fiction I wrote became somewhat less popular, I've been moving gradually over towards the fantasy side of the world, um, been publishing mostly short fiction for the past few years. I teach at a university where I teach writing short stories. So I kind of felt like it was necessary to publish some just to keep my authenticity there. But I've just finished a novel and I'm ready to start going back into long form, my first love. Um, and I will talk about when I met Carol at a Sycamore Hill um, and other stories oh, later. <laughs> Thank you. And Greg. Hi, I'm Greg Feely. Uh, I write science fiction and about science fiction. Um, I was also at the um, Wednesday afternoon lunch uh, the science, uh, that uh, Michael and Carol was at. I guess my presence was a little, was a bit miss, less memorable than Carol's, but, but I came into town once a month to do and attended that. Um, I've published three or four novels, depending on how you count, and um, am in the uh, hallowed tradition of science fiction and publishing chunks of the one in, currently in progress in magazines. One uh, chunk appeared in the just uh, most recent issue of Asimov's and two more are appearing uh, Asimov's and Clark's World, I think, in the fall. So um, um, I knew Carol for about 40 years, uh, wrote some reviews of her books when I could, uh, and admired her work uh, enormously. Excellent. Thank you. So as you all can see, there's a, a little bit of a, uh, um, an unbalancing uh, of this uh, conversation of two writers because, um, and we're going to start with Rick Raphael because he's a writer with a much smaller body of work um, and one who has not achieved the um, prominence or, or respect in some ways that, that Carol M. Schwiller did. So, um, and I think for most, if not all of us, he was a relatively new name for us when we got onto this panel. So I, I know I certainly had to do some research um, to find his work. Um, 
so I wondered if I, we might um, move it to someone who would like to give something of an overview and, and um, some ideas on, on Rick Raphael before we move on to Carol Emschwiller, who I think we're all more better positioned to talk about. Greg, did you want to? I can say a little bit. Um, Rick Raphael wrote in the, between the late 50s and the mid 60s, almost entirely for Analog uh, magazine. Um, sometime in the around 1966, he published a novel. It was called Code Three. Um, it was about the super highways of the future, the super fast cars that ran on them, and the special kind of cop who has to keep these things under control. I read it as a teenager a few years after it was published, around 1970. I sensed immediately it was not the sort of thing that I like to read. Um, and until he uh, was awarded the Cordwainer Smith Prize uh, this year, and we were told there'd be a panel on him, I had not much thought about him. I do, diligently went and read some of his stories. Um, Robert Sawyer, who was one of the jurors, jurors who gave this award, uh, identified one as a, a, a masterpiece of humor. I read it and, and could not find it funny myself. Uh, I know that in England, um, he published a collection. The publisher who brought out his novel published a collection. It was called The Thirst Quenchers. He had published a story in analog called The Thirst Quenchers. It was about hydrological engineers doing wonderful things. I think the, the slightly tone deaf sound of the title kind of tells you a little bit about the kind of writer he was like. Um, um, I, when I heard that because, um, because there was not a reader con last year, there were two Cord Winner Smith winners um, to catch up on um, and they were proposing to put them both in the same panel I wrote ReaderCon and said, I don't think that works. Could you maybe even just give Rick Raphael his own panel? And if no one wants to be on it, I would be willing to. But I think they really should have separate panels. Um, and you know, I got no reply to that. So, so here we are. Um, I can't pretend to say have much more to say about his work than that. Yep. I, I sought out um, some of those analog stories as well as one that was uh, Judith Merrill reprinted in the, her 10th annual Best of the Year, which surprised me. Um, I wish Judith Merrill were still alive and here to explain what uh, she saw in it because I, I struggled. Um, it, it's written in a, a sort of attempting faux appellation kind of dialect. Um, I for the story, dialogue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I think it was attempting to be humorous, but I'm not sure. Um, so yes, a real challenge for us um, when we also have Carol M. Schwiller to discuss. Any other thoughts before we move on? Well, I read that same story that you did, Matt. I, I'm, I'm blanking on the title. I think it's just the person's name, maybe. Um, yes, it's, it begins with an S. Yeah, Sunny. And... Um, yeah, the stories that I read were, were really concerned with like psionic powers. And I guess the, the sort of the one kind of grain of interest that I found in them was like the contrast of psionic powers with something else, some other thing. And that was kind of what was the generator of the story. And in, in the case of that, it was this kind of very, I thought, stereotypical hillbillies who all seem to have uh, mental powers. And the other story I read, it was um, mentally ill people, you know, cra crazy people, as they would have said back then, um, who, who yet had vast mental power. So I, I did think that that was kind of an interesting, smashing those two things together to get a story was, was an interesting move, at least. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. All right, in the interest of time, um, I thought we might move on to Carol M. Schwiller, who I, I know all of us have a, a closer connection to. Um, so I thought we might go around and, and allow people to talk a little bit about um, what is the meaning of Carol M. Schwiller in your life and, and what in her work has really stood out for you. And then we'll see what sort of themes we, we can pull out of that and ideas we can pull out of that for conversation. Um, let's go um, backwards this time. Um, Greg, you want to <laughs> we'll go back to you and then we'll go the reverse sure. of how you the intros. Very briefly, um, the first story I ever read by Carol Lemschwiller was the, the 1967 story, Sex and or Mr. Morrison. It appeared in Dangerous Visions. 
uh, which I read these pretty much as soon as it came out back in the days when the California public libraries were, were well funded and double A science fiction titles would appear right away. Um, I was 12 years old. I did not understand the story, but <laughs> I liked it. And <laughs> within a few years, I was finding within a year or so, I was finding stories by her in Damon Knight's Orbit in um, in Judy Merrill's old anthologies, which I was finding secondhand in Universe, in um, more in original anthologies than in magazines. In the late 60s and early 70s, she appeared um, in the science fiction field, at least, almost exclusively in the anthologies. And um, about 10 years later, the early 80s, when I was um, a young writer living in the Northeast, uh, I'm still a young writer living in the Northeast, I guess. Um, I met her at some Science Fiction Writers of America um, functions, found her very nice and approachable, unassuming. And when finally she began to publish collections with some regularity and around the same time, number of novels, I reviewed them usually for the Washington Post whenever I could and um, read her over a period of uh, the last 50 years. I think she's an extraordinary writer. Wonderful. Sharianne. Okay, so I have to say two things um, about my relationship with Carol and her work, and neither of them reflect terribly well on me. So there you go. Um, the first one is I started reading her stories when I was a um, a kid in high school, and I was being too snotty to read in genre. I started out loving genre when, our genre, when I was nine years old, the very first book I bought with my own money was um, Andre Norton's um, The Stars Are Ours. But, uh, and that was when I was nine. I'd actually been reading it before. But by the time I got to high school, I knew I wanted to be a writer and I was being literary and snotty. Uh, I think we're allowed to go through a period like that. But, <clears throat> but I still secretly loved science fiction, um, but I didn't want to admit it. And that's when I ran across the first stories I read by Carol because, oh my goodness, these were really good literary stories. And, and they were kind of secretly that other stuff, but they were secret and they were wonderful. And I, I loved them and it made me just feel so good. Uh, and then, um, and I kept reading her stuff even after when I started college, I decided to come out and be a science fiction reader and yeah, let the chips fall where they may. They really fell, obviously, hard. Uh, I met her when I went to a Sycamore Hill before I published. And I was writing a book that, and I got, this is the bad part, um, I was, Bruce Sterling ripped me up and down, said that I would never be able to publish anything, take my stuff and go home, little girl. You have no ability, no talent. Um, you can't write. Um, needless to say, I was never invited back and I hid for the rest of the, the time. But Carol, her critique of what I brought in, it was the first chapter of a book that later, that was actually under contract at the time and was published and um, <clears throat> broke me into higher sales, no less. Uh, Carol said that she really loved what I was doing with the language. She thought that my writing was wonderful and she pretty much saved um, me from going entirely suicidal. And I have, so I adored her as a person. And okay, I'm gonna tell my kind of weird, little teeny tiny bit gross story about Carol from Sycamore Hill, which other people probably noticed as well. When we were at Sycamore Hill, the way it worked is uh, there was this big 
uh, kitchen and breakfast stuff was laid out in the kitchen. You made your own breakfast. And there were all kinds of beverages. There was coffee, tea, three kinds of soda, um, orange juice, grapefruit juice, just about anything you can imagine to drink milk, um, both whole milk and skim milk, anything you can imagine wanting to drink non-alcoholic for breakfast. And Carol took a great big glass and she went around the, the set of uh, counters, which were in U shape, and she poured a little bit of each of those things into one glass. I mean, coffee, tea, milk, orange juice, all into one glass and drank it all together. I promised you it was a little bit gross. <laughs> so. Richard. Uh, well, like Greg, the very first time I encountered Carol's work was reading um, Sex and or Mr. Morrison in, in Dangerous Visions. And, uh, and then, yeah, I guess I would see her stories when I would look in like orbit anthologies, maybe even quark anthologies, although I'm not sure if she was in Cork as well. Um, but th that's kind of where I'd see her work. But then like so many things in science fiction, um, I met John Kessel when I was an undergrad and he was sort of the first domino in a very long chain of dominoes uh, for me. Uh, and he had been to Milford, he had started some more with some other folks. And um, because Carol you know, went to Milford she, she, and he knew her, she would get invited to, to Sycamore Hills. And so she went to a bunch of them. I went to the first one in, uh, my first one was in 92. And she attended and, you know, yeah, like I said, by then, um, I said this earlier before the panel, uh, the, the main thing I'd read was sort of scattered stories here and there and then the joy in her, joy in our cause collection. Um, so it was interesting to talk to Carol about that at that point in her career. The, the one thing I'll say right now is just, I totally agree with Sherry. I mean, like Sherry Ann's anecdote about the critique circle. Um, I, I saw that time and time again, there, uh, like a story would go around and maybe it wasn't, it was getting a lot of dings or a lot of negative feedback. And then Carol was, would always be the person who would like, would say, you're, no, you're all wrong. You're all wrong about this. She would, she would probably have a pencil she was pointing with even. She'd say, you're all wrong and here's why. And she would go through and she would explain like, no, I, this is what I like. I like the language, I like the style, I like this, I like that. That was, that was often the role I saw her play in, in Critique Circle. Wonderful. Michael. Um, yeah. I, well, Greg used the word unassuming to talk about Carol. And I kind of, that was, I, I would have used the word self-effacing. It's very unusual for a writer to really be that. They, some writers pretend to be that. She, I think she really was. And I was, just thought I'd pass along a few anecdotes. Um, one is we were at some kind of convention, a science fiction thing. I was in Manhattan. And uh, Carol was scheduled to receive a, an award. And we some for some reason, I don't know how it happened, but my wife and I were hanging out with her and she said, oh, I don't really want to go in, go in there and get this award. And I said, but Carol, you're an important person. And she looked at me and she said, no, I'm not. I'm very characteristic. Um, another anecdote was that she was walking in the city one time and was hit by a car, broke, broke her leg. And uh, the woman who went around the corner and hit her was hysterical, according to Carol. And so Carol went up to her and said, are you all right? That was characteristic. And another time we were at, at a lunch and she said, everything I've written in my life is hanging around my neck in one of these flash drives. So I, I find it interesting that this kind of very humble, self-effacing, unassuming quality is attached to a person who a lot of people feel it was a very strong feminist, where you would think that a feminist is going to be assertive. And I would argue that when Carol had said in an interview that she, one of her favorite writers was Franz Kafka, that I think there's a connection there 
and Kafka is one of my favorite writers. Uh, Kafka did not um, challenge the, the authoritarian system directly, but rather subversively and often through animals, and which is what Carol does. And I love Carol's animal stories, and but in particular, the animal stories. And what she does is, because it's about animals, she can sort of suggest things and say things that really undercut uh, the society in a feminist way. And I was very much taken with that. Um, I, at the time that she was writing a, a book, she was very negative about it. Maybe publishers didn't like it. And she asked if I would look at it, uh, a draft of it. And I said, I th said, I think this is the best thing you've ever done. It was the mount. Mm -hmm. And that apparently gave her a boost. And she was very pleased. Um, I mean, I, I had some editorial suggestions, but I doubt that they were very important. So um, anyway, I can talk about the mount and, and her kind of um, her feminism, but um, maybe at a later time or sure. however. Thank you. Um, for myself, it began like many of us with um, Sex and or Mr. Morrison and Dangerous Visions. Because, And when I was 14 or 15, I was a member of the Science Fiction Book Club and I got Dangerous Visions from them. And um, the stories that most blew me away were, were Carol's and uh, David Bunch's, uh, the Motorhead stories. Uh, <laughs> I was a weird kid. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so uh, later on, I, I first met her when I was in college because I went to college at NYU and um, uh, Gardner de Zouis used to organize a series of readings um, and, and I went to one of them and it, it got kicked out of its normal place at Dixon Place, I think. And so we were wandering up and down Third Avenue and I was next to Carol M. Schwiller and I knew who she was because I had seen a picture of her somewhere, um, but I didn't want to tell her because I loved her. I had also read uh, The Start of the End of It All. I had gotten that book. Um, and just loved it so much. But I was so in awe of her because, you know, to me, if I knew of a writer and I liked their work, they were super world famous. And so I assumed they traveled in limousines and all of that. And I couldn't believe that we were walking up and down Third Avenue looking for some place where people could read. Um, and she was just chatting with me about, you know, life at NYU and in New York and stuff. Um, and later on, I got to, to remind her of that um, when I interviewed her for some things. Um, but really her fiction has, has stuck with me so much. Um, and her short stories in particular, I've read all of the novels, but, but again and again throughout her life, it, it was the short stories I kept coming back to. And I wondered for this group then, what is it about her work? If we're talking about the work of Carol M. Schwiller, what is it that lasts for you? We've all been reading her a long time. Um, what keeps you coming back and what lasts for you? Anybody? Um, I'll say very briefly, um, while what could be called her themes are important and animals play a role through all of her fiction. Uh, her, her earliest memorable stories, uh, would you include one called Pelt, uh, another called The Hunting Machine are all deal with animals, the hunting of animals and transformation runs through her work. Um, transformation between human and animal uh, happens all the time. For all that, what is most memorable to me in her work is her voice, or her sentences, and the rat. At, when the, the works that began to appear in the late '60s were radically different. Um, they tended to be in the first person. They tended to be non-science fiction, uh, although some were published in places like Orbit and, and Dangerous Visions. Um, they were set in the present tense, um, and they were told in a voice that was um, now 50 years later, I just say, oh, this is Carol talking about herself. This is the character in the story who's unnamed is Carol Lemschweller. I would not have said that back when I was you know, studying new criticism in college and being very careful not to mess these things up. But for all that there was all these non-trivial changes, the really striking thing was her voice. She's no longer telling us what's happening on this planet to this young woman whose you know, husband is, is off you know, asteroid mining or something. Um, the sentences are, are radically different. And to me, that remains 
what is quintessential about her work? I'd have to second and third that, that the thing that shocked me from the very first that just brought me in were her sentences, her language. It's so rich and so crystalline. And it never, there is not one single story. I would challenge anybody to find one page of her writing that does not just ring with clarity and um, really beauty rhythms that are, um, it, it's, it's bell-like. And I think in many ways, she was a very big influence on my own language, although I can't claim to be anywhere near her mastery, but when I need to go back to, um, when I think my language is getting muddy or messy, it, she's the one I go back to. I, sit down and read a couple of her stories and get immersed in them again to go back to my own writing because, um, and I, this is not in any way to belittle her themes or her characters, but oh my goodness, her language just sings in ways that so many other great science fiction writers doesn't. I think she's right up there with Delaney. I think the two of them might be the two, two of the greatest writers of the 20th century. What, what strikes me about her writing uh, is that unlike many writers uh, who she, she's not making a point, but rather the story is making the point so she doesn't, as if she would say, I, she doesn't know in advance what's going to happen on the next page. So she's taking her cues from the characters or what's going on. And I think that's a very powerful way to approach writing because it's going to be different. It's going to be have surprises. And I think that's, for me, that's one of the strengths of her um, writing. Yeah, I'm gonna agree on voice and I'm also gonna add like, you know, one thing about the voice in a lot of her stories is she's really, really funny. And I don't think a lot of people appreciate how incredibly funny she is because I think they, maybe they see the, the flat photo or something and they think, well, this person's not gonna be a funny person. And I think she's hilarious if you kind of know how to read her. I, I just reread to, to prepare for this panel. I just, I, I mean, I reread a bunch of stuff, but one of the stories I reread was, um, Dracula Alucard, which is a, a story exactly like uh, Greg Feely mentioned. You know, it's a it's a story about a very Carol uh, narrator who is, is transformed in uh, you know uh, by the end of the story, and it's just so funny. The opening is so funny, and it's also kind of what Michael just said too, where her stories, because Carol, you know, just you know didn't plot beforehand, um, like. They, they unfold and, and because they're close first person, you know, you're getting this like constant sort of like the thoughts of this first person. And, you know, people talk about how the way her narrators can be like reliable or unreliable. And I think it's, I think it's, sometimes it's the reality that the narrator is perceiving is unreliable because they're just kind of proceeding along incrementally through, through the story. But yeah, I, I definitely want to hit the fact that like, she was just so, so funny. Yes, I was just rereading um, the story, the start of the end of it all. Um, and my Lord, that is a, just an amazing piece of, it is hilarious because, but it's also like rousing, like you, by the end, you're so like ready to go and, and storm the barricades with an old woman and her cats um, as they save the world. Um, it's just astounding. And some of the, and her, the precision of her timing, that's the thing, because humor isn't just funny stuff, it's also the timing of it. Um, and she just will come out with these perfect little lines at exactly the moment you're not expecting it. I was about to say that um, not only is she very funny, as, as we've all been noting, but her titles are funny. And I said once in a review that she has the best titles of anyone. And I'm looking at her first book, Joy in Our Cause. There's a great title. And there are stories here with titles like Biography of an Uncircumcised Man, including Interview, the last two words in a parenthesis. Um, Metapyrrolene hydrochloride sometimes helps. 
And um, my favorite short story title, maybe another long march across China, 80,000 strong. Uh, how could you not pick up um, a volume with, with stories like that? Um, her, her um, oh, I won't believe on the point. Her, 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 well, it, it, her it, very it, titles were wonderful. It makes her a very appropriate winner of the Cordwainer Smith Award because Cordwainer Smith was also a, a fabulous titler. And I, now I forget where, where I was going to go with that. So <laughs> um, one of the things that came up for me, I thought was, well, was interesting is in addition to the animals, there's also an ongoing interest in predator and prey. Um, which you see, she said when she was working on the mount or just before she was working on the mount after she finished Leaping Man Hill, she took a class in predator prey relationships. And I, when, I, when I read that, I thought, well, you could have taught that class. <laughs> it goes back to so much, even her early, early stuff like hunting machine. Um, there is this sense of predator and prey. I don't know what to make of that. It's just an observation. She talked about marriage often in terms of predator and prey. Yes. Um, and towards the end, I, uh, I was, it was, I go back and look at the stories that I first came to her, her reading in the late 60s and early 70s. And I found it very hard not to read about, you know, her, her first person narrator, who is an, unass an unassuming woman, whose husband is a little bit of a braggart and a little bit of a bully. And, you know, throwing out all I know about the new criticism, I'm thinking, was Ed Ensch really like that? <laughs> um, there that's, actually that, a number that, was, that was unfair, but um, yeah, hunter and prey in in terms of you know seeing marriages in terms of hunter and prey, and of course the wife is the prey. Right. Until it switches, because she has a number of stories where the wife is the prey and the wife is completely unassuming and battered and put down, and then something switches it. Something happens at the end, um, including that story, but also Glory, Glory, where the woman is uh, suddenly is, she's a goddess and it drives her husband nuts and all these people, no, 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 they ignore him and, and that drives him crazy. And she's trying to be good little uh, wifey and, but all these people insist on treating her like a goddess and, and, and she likes it. Yeah. But she she works that kind of switch uh, in role, and that happens in a lot of her stories very subtly, too. That's another thing I have to say I really appreciate is that even in her unplotted stories, as she says, they're structured, not unplotted. I mean, they are they are not plotted, but they there is structure, is that I think she's interested in... Um, the relationships, uh, the power relationship, but that the power relationship isn't always maintained or how it looks, how it appears. And that if you start peeling away layers of it, which she does very effectively, um, and you start to peer inside of it at the bottom, and sometimes she doesn't take it all the way to the bottom that you have to do a little bit of the work um, that you start to see that that power relationship isn't entirely the way it appears. And that's another thing too, uh, that she doesn't always give you all the answers that you have to take the extra step or two. And that, again, is one of the reasons why I think that she hasn't been as, um, as lauded as she deserves to be, because a lot of readers are lazy, and they don't want to do the, take the extra effort, although that's where a lot of the rewards are, is to, is to see it and extrapolate the one extra point and then go, ah. Oh. Or at least that's my feeling. That gets complicated with some of her narrators, too. I was just remembering back years ago, there was some controversy over her story, Boys, 
um, in the early 2000s because it's, it's one of her most unreliable narrators and she was having great fun with it. And I think at least one reviewer took it as this very kind of anti-male story, um, which bothered her tremendously. <laughs> um, but she seemed to, she had a, a, a mischievous streak more than a streak perhaps um and mm -hmm. i think she really loved especially as she began to see herself as perceived in a certain way she really loved playing with that you know, and one of the things because timmy duchamp talks about talking with her about are you a feminist and she she rejected the label um which was interesting um and i think in, in stories like boys may have been been having fun playing around with that i don't know that label is so loaded, though, right? and it comes with so many preconceptions that so many people put things on it uh, to the point that in some ways, unless you go through a set of definitions before you start talking, it can be more detrimental to any useful and productive discussion than, um, than any kind of a help. Yeah. Carol addressed this point explicitly in a story I can't recall the title, but it appeared in Lady Churchill's Wrist Bud Wristlet. Wrist Bud Wrist. You got it. Thank you. Um, the story is told the point of view of um, the students in a elderly woman's writing writing class. Uh, the woman uh, won't they won't give her name, but her initials are C E. Um, and Carol is is just as cl as close to coming out and saying this is me as she ever did, and she came pretty close this sort of dancing forward, dancing back way. But at one point, this CE, this, this tiresome teacher um, says, I'm not a feminist. Now, the students are all um, you know, scandalized. And she says, um, you, you don't remember the things I write about women, just the things I write about men. And I thought, okay. Um, it was, um, I don't think Carol would have written that story, putting herself out as being the figure be, behind the fictitious figure so clearly did, were she not comfortable in disclaiming the term, which, which was interesting. I, I, I don't have an answer to that. Um, like Sharyan, it was uh, an interesting aspect of a, uh, of a complicated personality. So we've had a question that's come in. Um, and since we have limited time, I thought I'd throw that out to you because it's also a question I have, um, which is, could you talk about her late stories and this huge outpouring? I just did the math last night and in Collected Stories Volume 2, it's almost 600 pages of stories in very small print from 2002 to 2012. So a 10-year period um, that was hugely fertile for her. Um, what do you think about those and, and her presentation of war in so many of those stories, bird people, the West, and of course, men and women? Anyone want to tackle it? It's huge. I don't know if I can explain, you know, why that was, um, but, uh, you know, by that point, she had, she had stopped attending. She, her last Sycamore Hill she attended was 2001. She brought uh, coup people, I think, which speaking of which, yeah, you know, that's, she was, animals were a big part of it, but it was always sort of animals that could fly, you know, birds, butterflies, bats, and like flight or sort of flight, like not really very good flight was often a, a part of her stories. Um, and I think that definitely speaks to uh, things that Sherry Ann was talking about, about sort of um, transformation and liberation uh, that that happened in the stories, um, as to why as to why she picked those scenes, I, I, I don't really know. One thing I noticed um, is how long those stories are. Uh, many of the stories are by Carol standards, um, very long, meaning seven thousand, eight thousand words long from an author who who rarely ventured above forty five hundred words. Um, they were tightly plotted. They were almost all of them science fiction, not fantasy and not whatever you want to call the work she did in the late 60s. Um, it was SF, and she published it in Asimov's and, and F and SF. Um, I'm still coming to grips with it. Um, some of them I find less compelling than 
the work that I most love from the 70s and 80s, and that just might be my, you know, difficulty responding to work that came after the days when I was most receptive. I hope that's not the case, but I, I see other authors, readers responding that way. Um, it is very clearly a, a, a stage of its own. She identified it as the fifth stage of her writing. And um, I really don't feel as, as comfortable around it or that I understand it or probably appreciate it as much as I do what she was writing 20, 25 years earlier. Mm. And I can't account for that. I find it very hard to generalize. There are so many stories and they are so different. And yes, you can put together certain categories, certain themes she was writing about, but it's, it's such a huge body of work. And I actually found myself um, liking as many of, or falling in love with a lot of those stories. Um, one of the things is, is that her ear for language, her, that glory of language um, is every bit as good, if not better, more perfect than it ever was. Um, and there is a warmth in those stories that I found. Um, a kind of a kind of forgiveness in a way, um, a charity that in some ways perhaps the kindness that was in her as a person that she's freer to be that person on the page, if that makes any sense to people. I mean, I don't know if I'm expressing this well, um, uh, but I'm, I'm, and it's not all of the stories because I can't generalize it. And certainly there are warm and um, generous and forgiving stories in her earlier work. It's just, if I had to say proportionally, there are more in the later work. But that's just my, me, perhaps, my reading. I think that kindness comes out definitely in stories like Creature, say, um, where, you know, it's, and, and I think that's a very Carol move, actually, where it's, that story is not about this very high stakes thing that's happening in the background, which is this like war between these societies that can genetically engineer these beings. And like, that's not what she cares about. And that's not the story she's going to tell you. She's going to tell you the story about this person who's been traumatized by those events, meeting, you know, this genetic weapon and, and befriending it, right? And like, and that's the story. And it's a very, it's a very, it's a story about kindness and gentleness in the midst of this, you know, like the science, you know, the science fiction slip paperback novel would be about that war. And it's, this is not about. Yeah, well, she was, I was always very positive, um, not not a bitter person, not negative. Um, um, that I think that's characteristic of her throughout. I, I can't think of of any anything that that she ever wrote that was uh, that was a downer, really. I mean, though there are plenty of things that are on there's sadness and there's misfortune. Yes, slavery but she finds love in slavery. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, when those stories were coming out, the later stories after around 2004 or so, I remember feeling deluged by stories because I was, I knew the places she was publishing. I was, I was subscribing to them and all. And it just seemed like there was a lot of it. And I, I individually, I couldn't quite grasp onto a lot of them. And then I Live With You came out from Tachyon, the first collection of them, really. Um, and then I was like, okay, now I can, as a body, I can begin to see what's really going on here. And then the two, the um, really interesting PS publishing collection, they did a two dosa dose volume, um, you know, flip it over, you get the other, uh, the other book, these two separate collections as one book, which is really neat. Um, and that one of those was in a time of war. And I remember really, that was where I go, oh yeah, this is it. It was after, you know, the, 
who are in the midst of the Iraq war and the long Afghanistan war and all of that, which clearly she was responding to. Um, and I, as a body of work, I found them really powerful, um, even as when they were first coming out, as I read them one by one and amidst other things, I didn't appreciate them as much. We're at just about five minutes, so I wanted to end with uh, a simple question, which is for people who, since we're rediscovering Carol M. Schwiller, um, where should people rediscover her? Should they, what should they read if you're like, oh, this sounds interesting? Um, where, what would you recommend to folks? Michael, do you want to start? Well, I mean, I, I, I would, I would tell people who who knew nothing about her uh, to read the Mount. I think that's a really very powerful, uh, strong uh, story, and it has a lot of her her in it. Yeah, we didn't even get a chance to talk about her novels, but I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. Yep, Richard. Oh, I mean, where, where do you not start? I guess, um, I mean, I probably wouldn't start with the Western novels or with Joy in Our Cause maybe, but other than that, I just think like all the entry points are great. I mean, the stories I've mentioned even, you know, read Creature, um, read read Dracula Alucard. It's, it, you know, it, um, they're just charming stories that, you know, no one else writes exactly that way. Sharyan? I think it depends on the person and what kind of mood they're in because, her body of work is so great that you can tailor it for what you're feeling at the moment in the mood for and what you're looking for. So if you're looking for something funny, you can, you can tell from the title if it's a funny story. If you're looking for something that's just going to be um, warm and make you feel happy um creatures or glory glory um if you want something that's going to feel very um uh engaging and take you down an interesting road i'd say i don't know maybe anything <laughs> Honestly, it's hard to go wrong. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But but you know you can just see um, you and you because she's so good at titles. Um, kind of figure what kind of what you're in the mood for. Hey, Greg, Carol's work, her short fiction was pretty well served by anthologists, and the stories of hers that got picked up in year's best collections. A couple of them were in Nebula Award volumes, including the one that won for best short story really represent her work fairly well. So if I were to you know, recommend where, where to start, um, most of the six or seven collections that she you know, assembled herself and put, put out in her lifetime are out of print. Uh, they're not terribly hard to find in the used book market, but they're, 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 you're not gonna walk into a store and see one. And the two volumes are really for, for university libraries and, and for people who know her work extremely well like us. Um, she really needs to have a best of, not a collected, but like 300, 350 pages, best of Carol M. Schweller, assembled by someone who knows where her best is. Um, otherwise though, for the person who look, wanting to look around, I would say, yeah, look at the year's best anthologies. That's a good place to start. Yeah. And Small Beer Press is a great friend of ReaderCon and their, their collection report to the men's club is a good one if you want the stories and they published a few of the novels. All right, um, so we are closing. So I have to tell you that uh, thank you first for coming. And um, the conversation is going to continue on Discord in the hallway track, uh, hallway track two that's related to the session. I'll head over there myself um, and anybody else who can as well. Um, how, many, how many people were, have been attending this? I don't know. <laughs> I don't either. Yeah, we don't have a way to tell. <laughs> oh, oh, well. Um, we don't have any way to know. So um, thank you, the, the many hundreds of people uh, who are out there um, watching. Oh. <laughs>